take all the steps that they possibly can to ensure that our communities are safe. We've had some very, very successful meetings with some of the uh, apartment owners uh, in the Eastern District in particular. Uh, they've really stepped up their game. They're working very collaboratively uh, with Captain Robinson. Uh, Captain Robinson, like uh, was said earlier, has done some walkthroughs on properties to improve lighting, to point out where some video cameras would be helpful. And in return, you know, we, we, we will give, if necessary, we'll give some added patrols in those areas if, the, if there is a problem property. Um, with regards to the nightclubs, uh, we don't want to have nightclubs operating uh, in our community that are irresponsible. Uh, and what we've seen in a couple of instances, and I won't call them out by name, is we had some serious violent incidents at a couple of clubs in our community. And what the business owners have essentially done is close the doors and not cooperate with the police. We are not going to have that. Uh, what we will do in those cases is we will call ABC. Uh, we will uh, restrict their entertainment license. We will do everything possible to ensure uh, that they are being safe business owners. We don't want that type of behavior going on here in Prince William County. Uh, I know that the Potomac Inn on Route 1 is of concern uh, to a lot in the community. I see a lot of people uh, writing emails about some of the uh, illegal activity that we've seen up there. Captain Hugart will talk a little bit about what we're doing up there. We've made some pretty significant uh, progress on trying to get the owner of that property uh, to be more compliant, to ensure that the folks that are, uh, that are on his property are not involved in illegal activity. Uh, we've had some success, but we're gonna continue at it until that place is a, is a safer place. Uh, on the traffic front, like Supervisor Franklin said, we have had uh, way too many uh, traffic fatalities in Prince William County. Last year, we had 28. Uh, this year, right now, we're on pace to have about the same number. Uh, 28 is about a 10-year high in Prince William County. So it's, that's a significant number of people. But you, you, know, you, you also drill down a little bit, and you'll see we've had an increase in overall traffic crashes. The things that are contributing to traffic crashes primarily in Prince William County are speed, uh, inattention, uh, and uh, running red lights. This year, we're seeing a, an increase in the number of fatalities that have resulted from drivers running red lights. Um, there's a couple of things that we are doing. Uh, we're right in the throes of the Drive Sober campaign, so you will see uh, Prince William County Police out there uh, doing sobriety checkpoints uh, in the coming days. Uh, Starting next week for at least a week, we're gonna do a traffic blitz uh, in and around all of our schools uh, here in Prince William County. As everybody knows on Monday, it's the first day of school. Uh, we wanna assure with 100% certainty that when our kids are traveling to and from school uh, that they're doing so safely. One of the things we gotta remember is when, uh, you know, when school's in session, we're gonna have a lot more parents out on the road getting their kids to school. We're gonna have a lot more school buses out on the road and everybody has to exhibit a little bit of patience. Maybe get up a little bit earlier on Monday morning uh, so we're not speeding through our community when our kids are out there on the street. Uh, the other thing that uh, Supervisor Franklin alluded to is the, uh, the Board of County Supervisors right now is taking a look at uh, whether or not we need a photo enforcement here in Prince William County. Uh, if any of you have heard me talk on this topic before, I will tell you I 100% believe that we do need photo enforcement here in Prince William. Uh, there are not enough police officers in Prince William County uh, to have a significant impact on enforcement. We have increased our enforcement actually in the Eastern District. We've increased it by 13% this year, but that's a drop in the bucket when you talk about the number of drivers that we have on our roads. Uh, the places where they're looking at photo enforcement, they're looking at intersections that are particularly problematic. They're looking at the red lights there. Uh, they're also looking at construction zones and school zones. Uh, and then what the, what the survey will do is it'll bring information back to the Board of County Supervisors as to whether or not uh, they collectively want to proceed with this program. I'm a strong proponent of it, uh, and I'm hopeful that the board will, will uh, move in that direction so we can uh, you know, maybe slow down some of the crashes and some of the, particularly some of the traffic fatalities that we've had in our community. Uh, one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with uh, in all of our patrol districts is we're dealing with a lot of 
calls for service uh, where we have people in crisis. Uh, it's either a mental health crisis or a substance use disorder crisis. Uh, and so it's a lot of time that our police officers spent. Uh, the good news is we have been very effective with uh, training most of our police officers in crisis intervention training. So when they get on the scene, they can de-escalate these situations. In fact, this year, uh, we received a federal grant to expedite that training. Right now, uh, about a third, a little bit over a third of our officers are trained in crisis intervention training. We're hopeful with this grant, we can get the majority of our officers trained. In addition to that, uh, we have what's called a co-responder program. And that's a program where our, one of our police officers who's crisis intervention trained uh, uh, parties up with a, a clinician. And when there's a call for service for somebody in crisis, then uh, the police officer and the clinician will respond together. Uh, if it's a dangerous situation, the police officer will take the lead. Uh, if it's a situation that doesn't appear to be dangerous, then the clinician will take the lead. Uh, and I got to tell you, this has been extremely effective. I, I can't tell you how many times during the course of the week that our officers are going into these situations. Uh, they're de-escalating the situation and they're getting the person uh, to the, you know, getting the person the the you know, to, to either a hospital or, or somewhere they can be treated, get, getting them the services that they, they rightfully deserve. Uh, another uh, announcement I think that has been out there and some of you have, may have heard it, the Board of County Supervisors has moved forward with creating a Prince William County's own crisis receiving center. Uh, that's in the process of, you know, being uh, developed. And what's going to happen over there, and this is great for the police department, it's going to be a place right here in Prince William County where if our police officers pick up somebody in crisis, we'll be able to bring them over to that crisis receiving center uh, and get them treated. It'll be a huge efficiency uh, for us because right now what happens is when we take somebody into custody who's in crisis, oftentimes what the police officer will have to do is they'll have to take them to one of our local emergency rooms. Uh, then they'll have to wait with that person until they're treated by the emergency room team. And then they have to wait uh, until there is a hospital that treats their particular disorder uh, that opens up somewhere in the state of Virginia. Sometimes we'll have police officers sitting at the hospital for days uh, waiting for that to happen. And then once a, a hospital is identified, sometimes our police officers are driving as many as five hours uh, to, to, to drop that person off. And they need the help, they need the treatment. But on the same token, uh, what happens then is you're losing police officers out there in your community, uh, making you safe. So this crisis receiving center is extremely good news. Uh, I think it's a win-win for the community. It's a win, obviously a win for the police department. Uh, I know uh, because, and I mentioned this earlier, because uh, school will beginning on, be beginning on Monday, uh, and the Uvalde, Texas shooting is fresh in all of our minds that people have a lot of concern about what's gonna happen at the schools in Prince William County. I can tell you that the Prince William County Police Department uh, spends a significant amount of time training every single officer to be able to respond to a situ situation like that. Uh, the Prince William County Police Department also has our own uh, SWAT team, uh, which would be able to, to to get into a school, God forbid, if something like that was to happen in our community. And we also have very, very close relationships uh, with the state police and with the other town police to assist us. So, so I, can, I want people to know that, like I said, God forbid, if we had a significant incident at one of our schools, uh, that you have a police department that's trained and ready to respond. Uh, I have spent, uh, since I've been the chief here, spent a lot of time uh, with the suit, the new superintendent, uh, I find her to be uh, legitimate. Uh, I think she is a, a, a great person to work with. Uh, she is very, very concerned about school safety, and she has uh, she is putting a lot of money from her budget into ensuring that our schools are safe. Uh, the schools and and the police department, uh, as many of you know, redid our MOU. That MOU uh, is a public document. I urge you to take a look at it. Uh, it shows some of the things that we're doing collaboratively together with our schools. Uh, we regularly meet with school security. 
Uh, in fact, on Thursday night, I'll be on another public uh, meeting uh, with the head of the school's uh, risk management team uh, to talk about school security. Uh, Delegate Guzman is hosting uh, that event for those of you who are interested. Uh, and then another piece to our school security and one of the things that I uh, truly believe in is our school resource officer program. Uh, we have uh, school resource source officers assigned to each one of our high schools uh, and we have them uh, assigned to our middle schools on a rotating basis. Uh, the school resource officers are invaluable in a lot of regards, uh, first and foremost, with developing positive relationships with our children. Uh, I can tell you if you walk into any one of these schools with a school resource officer, uh, kids gravitate around because they, they spend the entire school year developing positive relationships uh, with our kids. The other thing that our school resource officers bring to our schools is, is, is like I said, if something were to happen at our schools, you would have an officer on the scene to be able to respond. And, and we have had here in Prince William County just last school year, a couple of incidents that were very scary. One of them over at the Ripon uh, Middle School where we had somebody in the neighborhood who was actually firing rounds out there. And our school resource officer was quickly able to go out there, engage that person and safely take them into custody. The last thing that we get from our school resource officers, and a lot of you wouldn't see this, but I see it every day, when school is in session is our school resource officers get a lot of information from the kids about what's going on in and around the school. Uh, if somebody uh, is uh, potentially doing something that, that could be dangerous, uh, if somebody's uh, making a threat, uh, if somebody brings a weapon to the school, oftentimes those kids will let a school resource officer know and we can intercede to ensure it doesn't uh, turn into a tragedy. So I'm very comfortable with the relationship that we have uh, with our, our schools. And I am confident that we will have a very safe school year coming up. A couple of things we're trying to accomplish here on the police department. When I came to Prince William County, uh, we uh, had a police department, frankly, that was not very diverse. Uh, and it's one of the things that I'm trying to do uh, through the hiring process with our department is to make us more diverse. I am a firm believer that our police department uh, needs to reflect the community that we serve. And right now we don't. Uh, the last two classes that I was able to bring in on the police department have been extremely, extremely diverse. And we're gonna continue to, that, to do that uh, until we have a department that reflects the community that we serve. Uh, Prince William County is the 10th most diverse county in the country. Uh, and our, I think our police department ought to reflect that. I think every kid in Prince William County ought to be able to look at a police officer uh, and see somebody who looks like them. I think it's extremely important. Uh, uh, with regards to staffing, you probably know, uh, you probably have heard this or read about this in, in the newspaper or seen it on the news, is we, uh, like, unlike, just like a lot of other police departments in the Commonwealth, right now we're struggling. Uh, our applications uh, since the murder of George Floyd have gone down by about 40%. Uh, we have fewer people uh, that, frankly, that are interested in becoming police. Uh, so we are doing a lot of work around trying to recruit uh, young service-minded people to this police department. Uh, if you know a young person, I would urge you uh, to have them take a look at this job. Uh, this is a service profession. Police officers in Prince William County spend about 95% of their day uh, helping people. Uh, most of the kids that we're bringing in today, most of the young people, I shouldn't call them kids, these are young men and women uh, that we're bringing in as recruit officers are the type of folks that are saying, you know what, uh, I've heard what, what people are saying about the police uh, and I don't want anyone to have that experience and I'm here to be part of the change. So if, like I said, if you know someone who's interested, a couple other things for our younger people, our, our high school graduates that are interested in policing, uh, we have a cadet program uh, where you can come on, you can get paid uh, a salary, uh, and you can work with the police department. And our cadets matriculate when they turn 21 into becoming police officers. And for our high school kids, we have an explorer program. And right now, we're actually seeking applications uh, for young people that want to join uh, that program. So on the staffing side, right now, just to give you the numbers, we're down about 11% of our staffing. Uh, but we're going to do everything we possibly can to ensure that we have a full staff uh, of police officers in Prince William County. The other thing we're looking at 
uh, to make sure that we're policing better as we're looking to automate a lot of the things that we do on the police department. Uh, automation, as you know, is an efficiency. Uh, if our police officers are spending less time uh, with a pen uh, and a piece of paper uh, and they're doing things that are automated and more efficient, it means that they can spend more time out in our communities, uh, spending time with the folks that, that live and work here. Uh, so there's a number of, of initiatives underway to improve our efficiencies. Of course, like I said, that takes money. So you will hear me asking the Board of County Supervisors for that in the upcoming budget. And then the last piece I'll talk about is our engagement. Uh, I set, had one of my folks send me a list of the yearly events that we attend uh, where we engage with our community. And they are, there is a lot of them. Uh, if you do not follow us on social media, please do. Uh, we have a pretty heavy presence, a pretty heavy following on all of our social media sites. And if you want to know what the police department is doing to engage with our community, uh, you can pick that up uh, on any one of our social media sites. Uh, the couple that I will talk about, we just went through National Night Out, uh, which is the first Tuesday in August of every year. Uh, I went to a number of events this year. I, every year when I go out, the two years that I've gone out so far, I've spent it in a different part of the county. This, uh, this year, I just happened to be on the eastern side of the county. Uh, all of the events that I went to were well attended. And, and I will say this, uh, since I've been here in Prince William County, I have been very pleased uh, with the level of support that I've seen uh, from the community for our police officers. Uh, I can't tell you how many times that I will come into the office and uh, I work in the Central District Station. I'm in the upstairs of that station. When I come in, uh, somebody has left our police officers some food or you know, something to drink um, while they're working out there. And, and the amount of people that have come up and said, thank you for your service since I've been here has been really, really kind of kind of heartwarming. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, we started last year uh, a community day in Prince William County to celebrate our diversity. Uh, this event uh, has live music. It has displays from the police and the fire department. A lot of the service uh, uh, non-governmental organizations that support our community are at this event. They all set up tables, live music, food, uh, displays for the, the kids. Uh, it's going to be on September 24th uh, at the McCourt Complex on the plaza. Uh, it'll be from noon to four, and I'm hoping that you will all attend. Uh, the event is to celebrate our diversity here in Prince William County. And like I said, uh, hopefully you can join us. Now I'm going to pass uh, the mic real quick uh, to Major Hugart. He can introduce himself, tell you what he does uh, at the department, and then uh, he's going to pass it to Captain Robinson. Then we can take any questions that you all might have. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, everybody. My name is Kevin Hugart and I'm one of the three assistant chiefs for the police department. I'm responsible for all How about that. Okay, so I am responsible for operations division, which are the three different police districts that we have throughout the county. The Eastern District, the Central District, which covers Dale City up to the city of Manassas, and then the Western District, which is Noakesville, Gainesville, Bull Run, all of that area. Also, in addition to the police districts, I'm responsible for the Special Operations Bureau. That's where we have our motor officers, our crash investigators, our SWAT team, a lot of our part-time, our boat team, some of our part-time units. So it's a lot of people, basically everybody that you see driving a blue and white police car, police call for service, those folks all work for me in some capacity and they're busy on a day-to-day -day basis, but they love what they do and they love the interaction with the community. So I've been here for quite some time. Blah. Captain uh, Robinson, I will turn it over to him for just a second, and he's gonna explain to you what he does as the Eastern District Commander working out of the Garfield Station. Joe? Uh, thank you, Major. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Robinson. I'm the Eastern District Commander. Uh, I'm responsible for the six squads that are assigned uh, to this district here, Garfield, uh, to patrol the streets here uh, within the Eastern District. Uh, as far as directing patrol and uh, following uh, crime trends or anything and traffic trends as well, 
uh, to address any concerns that may happen in the district. I will turn it over to, to questions, I believe, at this point. Chief Newsom, did you have anything to add before we get to some of the questions? No, uh, other than those are two really good, hardworking people uh, that are out there doing everything they possibly can to ensure our community is safe. That's great. And if you have questions, please put them into the chat and um, I'll read the questions out. And before we get to, I know we see a couple of questions already. Um, Chief Newsom, we, we get a lot of uh, calls from um, residents within um, some of our HOAs. Can you talk about what the police department um, can do to work with the HOAs or what authority the police department has within the HOAs to kind of regulate what goes on um, in those communities? Because we get a lot of calls about um, parking. We get calls about, um, you know, um, you know, kids playing in the street or just, just whatever. We get all, all kinds of calls. But what authority do you all have versus what's in the realm of uh, the HOA itself? So there, there's a lot in that question to unpack. Uh, the first thing I will say is a lot of the homeowners associations here in the county will actually hire uh, off-duty police officers to, to be a, a, some security for them. Uh, that's completely appropriate. If people want to have a dedicated police officer in their community to handle those types of nuisance things, uh, you know, you just uh, get a hold of Captain Robinson. We can ensure that happens for your homeowners association. Uh, when it comes to parking issues on the homeowners association, that's something we can enforce with enforce with the authority of the uh, homeowners association. So that's something we can work out on any particular property. When you're talking about uh, people milling around, that's when it gets a little bit more difficult. Uh, there is an impression and sometimes a misunderstanding that the police can come up and do something about young people people that are just hanging around for lack of a better word. Uh, and there's really not a lot that the police can do in that circumstance. There's no lawful uh, reason for a police officer to stop or even interact with them. We can go up and talk to them, say hello. Uh, we can make a contact with them, but we can't ask them to leave. So that's, that's kind of a misimpression. Uh, it's a different story if somebody's breaking the law. If somebody is breaking the law, breaking into cars, vandalizing, in those instances, if you have a crime, the police can respond. And if we have cause... Uh, we can make a, a stop and, and take appropriate police action. Thank you. And then Captain Robinson, can you just talk a little bit about um, the work that you've done with, and Chief Newsom, feel free to jump in as well, about the work you all have done with some of the apartment complexes where we've seen some of the challenges um, and what, um, what helping those entities uh, could look like. Yes, I can uh, certainly address that. Uh, what I've done is I've gone around to uh, many of our apartment, uh, apartment complexes. I've spoken to the managers of those complexes to, to really get a, a handle on what their concerns are, uh, what issues they're having uh, within that area, uh, and then trying to come up with a plan. Uh, in one instance, for example, we brought in the fire marshal to try to give us an idea of what we could improve on some of the, uh, the exit points from the facility, which were uh, being used uh, for people to commit criminal acts. So essentially what we do, just go in there and just make an assessment. So after making those initial assessments with these apartment complexes and offering them suggestions on whether they would be in a position where they needed to hire an additional officer, uh, if something we could cover uh, with the existing force we have on the street, or if they would need to get independent security out there uh, I also assigned one of my watch commanders, there are six watch commanders in the Eastern District, uh, one for every squad. Uh, I broke down all the apartment complexes in between the watch commanders so they have a, a constant point of contact so they can keep up with any issues they may be having going forward so we can continue to stay on top of those things. Uh, and that's in conjunction with working uh, with the criminal division uh, to, to assist in that area as well for some of these I won't say routine, but ongoing issues that they be presented with. Sure. And then can you all just talk a little bit about um, the communities that don't have HOAs and that aren't um, necessarily um, in multi-family uh, or apartments? You know, what recourse do they have um, in terms of if they're experiencing some challenges with whether that be noise issues, whether that be break, you know, the cars getting broken into? Um, what recourse do those individuals have? 
Uh, we have individuals who call us uh, routinely uh, from those communities, uh, individuals within the community to let us know about issues they're having. They've either reached out to, to the district station over here, or they reached out to Chief Newsom's office uh, uh, and relayed that, or uh, to the board <laughs> in, in some cases. Uh, and, and we get those messages back to us, and then we will assign someone to, to address the issue they have. So we typically try to reach out to them, find out the specific specifics of their concern, uh, and then try to address the issue and give them a plan of action in reference to that. Yep. And then last question I have, and I'll start uh, reading the comments from uh, the chat is, you know, neighborhood watch used to be a big thing, I think, back in the day. Can you talk about if that is still something that's important, if it's necessary, if we've moved beyond that, if that's something we need to look uh, more into? Um, just talk a little bit more about how the community, I guess, can get involved in kind of being um, the eyes and ears. Uh, certainly with neighborhood watch, uh, still very important. Uh, to the community as a whole uh, to get an idea of what's going on in the neighborhood. Uh, you know, the police department relies on the support of the community uh, on a regular basis in order to solve some of these issues we have. Uh, as Chief Newsom pointed out earlier, as far as the last homicide we had uh, and that brazen, you know, attack there uh, and looking for witnesses in reference to that neighborhood watch would certainly come, uh, come in handy or would be important for us uh, in these situations to to address uh, the community issues and everything. So I think even in today's time in 2022, uh, it's still a very important part of the community. Okay, and actually you kind of just sparked one more question. For those that may have information, but may be afraid um, to give information, um, you know, because they may feel that they may get threatened or they may be close to someone involved, um, what's the best way for them to be able to share information without putting themselves in danger? They can, you know, provide information anonymously. I mean, we have uh, we have situations set up where they don't have to put themselves out there in order to provide information to the police. So they contact. It's not like we're gonna. That's going to become public information where they're going to be put in harm's way. That's great. Thank you. Um, the first question we had was in regards to school security. The question was posed of what happens when there is an active shooter outside and the students are also are also outside. So that uh, that's a situation that we would we would train for. So the, the approach uh, for any mass shooting has changed pretty dramatically since Columbine. Uh, when it's an active shooter and somebody is actively shooting a weapon, people are actively in danger. Uh, it could be a school or it could be anywhere else in our community then the response of the police is going to be immediate and, and it's, it's going to be, there's going to be a requirement that our police officers engage with that shooter. So our police officers are equipped with, as you know, with weapons and with vests uh, and we have other equipment. So we are tactically, what we're going to do in any situation where someone's actively shooting is we're going to try and mitigate that threat, uh, try and stop that threat from occurring. And then as other officers arrive on the scene, it would be able to, to try and coordinate uh, a, a safe um, exodus of the folks that are on the scene. Uh, as you know, uh, just this past year, we had a shooting at one of our football games. Uh, and that was a situation where somebody was shooting in the parking lot um, uh, over at Freedom High School at a football game. And immediately the police got on the scene. They were able to establish a reunification center where people who left the game could reunite with family and friends. They were able to safely get uh, every other uh, of the people out of there. And then they were able to establish a crime scene and to make an arrest. That same philosophy philosophy would be used for any type of active shooter uh, situation. And I got to tell you that the, one of the things we have in Prince William County that a lot of other agencies are not fortunate to have is we have our own training facility right here in the county. Uh, and our police officers not only get that training when they go through as a recruit, but they get ongoing training about what to do in the event of a crisis like that. Uh, it's one of those things that we plan for and we plan for, and we hope that we, we, never, we never have to use that training. And then you may have addressed this a little bit, but will public safety work with, with the schools on drills for outside in addition to inside? So essentially asking about drills. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that communication with the schools is going on all the time. We had our, uh, actually our SWAT team uh, did a series of meetings with school principals uh, over the summer uh, to try and train them on exactly what to do in the event of an active shooter. Because we want, we need to make sure that 
our police officers and our school administrators are all on the same page uh, for something like that. Okay. And then the next question is, Chief Newsham, what do you think we need in Prince William County to curve this out of control crime? And so uh, you can talk about kind of what you've done in, in response to the behavior, but can you also talk about on the prevention side? Yeah, that question was asked by uh, somebody who I hold near and dear to my heart. Um, she lost her son uh, to homicide here in the county, and, and no mother should have to lose their son uh, under those circumstances. But, but what I will say is there is, when I talk about the community engagement that we're doing and, and the, the, the activity, like, for example, with our school resource officers and our young people in this community, uh, those things, in my estimation, pay huge dividends in preventing crime. Uh, if you can get to a kid, you can uh, make a kid understand that the police are not the bad guy, that the police are here to help. Uh, I think those are the types of things that we do to try and prevent crime, establishing relationships, uh, continuing to try and build trust and respect within the community. Uh, and then we have our police officers interacting with our young people. We just had uh, this past summer. Uh, for Kilby Elementary School, we had a, um, a junior uh, police program where we had the kids come in and they got to see canine activities, spend time with our officers. It's those kinds of things that I think that are huge. That a lot of people don't see where we're building relationships, preventing our kids from being involved in crimes. I saw another question in here uh, talking about being uh, proactive with regards to patrol. Uh, and I think it was in the Powell Creek area. If you, if you, if you don't see um, regular uniform presence, please share that with us. I was just at a meeting uh, down there in Powell Creek and, and they were saying that they see the police come there, through there regularly. So if that isn't your experience, uh, we want it to be. Um, and you, I also heard you talk a little bit about people who are afraid to come forward. You, you can send any one of us an email, myself, uh, Major Hugart, Captain Robinson, the lieutenant who's responsible for your area, you can send any one of us an email and say, listen, I don't want you to use my name, but here's what's going on in my community. And I can tell you, uh, you better get a response because if you don't get a response, then come to me and I'll make sure you get a response. But I'm very confident that our police supervisors are going to respond. Uh, it's one of the things that we uh, feel is our responsibility when somebody reaches out to us and they say they want to give us information. If you want to do it anonymously, that's fine. And we'll do everything we possibly can to ensure that your particular concerns are addressed. Yeah, and I'll just read that question out loud just, just for those who may, may not be able to see it. it. It said regarding the area off Piles Creek, as well as Rip on Landing, these areas seem to continue to have shootings, but it's rare to see a squad car uh, in the neighborhoods anymore. Are there any plans to step up police presence in these problem areas? And how do you plan to be proactive and not just reactive um, in those neighborhoods and the shootings are now happening in broad daylight? So yeah, I think one of the things, uh, Supervisor, I'd like to say about that too, as we roll into the fall, we are actually across the county uh, implementing some overtime to ensure that there's, you know, because of the staffing that has dipped a little bit, we want to ensure that you're getting the same level of police service that you've grown accustomed to. So, you know, our officers will be working a little bit longer, a little bit harder, which is fine until we get our staffing where it needs to be. But we, we are trying to get out there to be visible and to be present in your communities. Yep. Then the next question, uh, I'm in Featherstone Station. We have talked about starting a neighborhood watch. We would like to know what our legal boundaries are in terms of approaching a person engaging in, in a crime. We have a lot of kids coming around checking our car doors. That, that's, I love that question. You've got somebody there who's sent in a, a question that wants to be proactive in their community and they want to help with public safety. So what I can offer to that person, uh, Supervisor Franklin, if you get me some contact information, we will have our community engagement team come out and give you the kind of all of the information on how we run a, a, one of those programs and, and the do's and the don'ts. We'd be happy to do it. Sounds good. And it may be necessary for other communities who are interested in that. You know, the, the chief and, and his guys um, are always willing to go to some of these um, HOA meetings or community meetings for those that don't have HOAs to kind of walk through those. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's a good question. If somebody's being very thoughtful, ask about what we can and what we cannot do. And, I, and you know, the, the, the kind of the baseline rule is we really want our community watch to be the eyes and 
ears of the police department. We can't be everywhere all the time. And eyes and ears include uh, cameras and videos. If you see something inappropriate, you see something untoward, uh, and you think you can safely capture an image of that, please do. Absolutely. And then the next question, we are in the process of installing a street lamp to try and deter people from coming into the community with bad intentions. And I guess, uh, Chief, if you want to talk a little bit about some of those other features that can help deter crime, such as cameras, lightings, um, things of that nature. Uh, lighting is, is I always uh, will suggest that if you can improve your lighting in your community, that is going to be beneficial. It's going to make people feel safer. Uh, and people who are inclined to, to do illegal things are going to be less likely to do it uh, in a brightly lit area. Uh, one of the, in the last five or so years, one of the things that I think has assisted law enforcement more than any other uh, technological advance is video cameras. Uh, if you can have, if you have a ring camera and, and you, or you, you know, you can afford a ring camera, please get one. Uh, I can't tell you there are countless crimes that we're able to solve as a result of our businesses and our community folks having cameras out there. Those cameras are huge. Uh, if you can do it, please do it. Uh, I can tell you if a crime occurs in your community, we're going to have police officers knocking on every door uh, to see if some if a neighbor has an image of the person that's responsible. At the end of the day, we don't want to see this stuff happen in our community. Uh, and we're going to do everything we possibly can to find the people that's responsible and ensure they're held accountable. Can you talk about what seems to be an uptick in reckless driving, running red lights, et cetera? It seems that I see someone run lights every day, including witnessing a motorcyclist dying because of this. Are you seeing this uptick as well? And if so, what are you doing about it? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely seeing it. Uh, it's troubling. A uh, part of it, I think, is uh, when we went two years during the pandemic where we had fewer cars on the road, people got grew accustomed to that. I think uh, speed is, is, a, is a significant problem. Uh, here in the county. Uh, like I said, we, we, I have given a directive and the district commander will tell you this to all of our district commanders that we do a better job of traffic enforcement, um, get out there and do what we need to do. But I truly believe that if we're really going to have an impact that we probably have to get some of these, uh, this automated traffic enforcement out into our community, particularly, particularly in and around our schools, um, the red light running, the speed, the driver in attention is literally costing us, unnecessarily costing us lives. All right. And then uh, next question is, with site-based management in Prince William County Schools, how are police able to keep up with policies at different schools? That's got to be a teacher that asked that question. I don't know. But I, there is a little bit of that going on. And we are trying, uh, with the superintendent's help, uh, to make sure that that um, is is corrected, uh, and and that in the event of a significant event at any one of our schools, that certain overall procedures and steps are taking place. Uh, that's part of the training that we did over the summer. I know that the superintendent uh, believes in that. Uh, there's always going to be differences at every uh, individual school. Every school is probably like its own individual community in and of itself. And there will be differences at the school, but when it comes to major events, there does have to be some set safety steps that have to be taken. Uh, one of the things I do know about the schools is that they are regularly required to have audits done on safety at their schools. Uh, if you have a site-based manager who's not uh, up to snuff, then I think they're being held accountable by the new superintendent. I don't wanna speak on her behalf, but uh, it's something I, I, I I think that uh, it, 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 there has to be a balance. I think that the principals have to be able to, to run their schools, but I think when it comes to major significant events, then we all have to be on the same page. Yep. And then uh, another question, can you please talk about the car meet at the commuter lots on Telegraph Road and the cars racing up and down East End of Prince William Parkway? Also, why are the people allowed to hang out at the 7-Eleven on the parkway in Route 1 at all hours of the day and night. Uh, Joe, I'm going to let you go ahead and take that. Yes, sir. In reference to the car meets, uh, we certainly have been working 
uh, in conjunction with Virginia State Police uh, in dealing with uh, with VDOT as well, uh, you know, dealing with the VREs in different locations of these car meets uh, try to happen on a regular basis. They're extremely difficult to manage due to the, the volume of cars that, that come to these car meets uh, and the number of officers that we have to, uh, to take on that issue. And that's why we've involved Virginia State Police. Uh, there have been signs placed at some of the BREs uh, for trespassing uh, that now we have enforceable and can force them to move from certain locations. And we just continue to just be present uh, when we see these car meets starting to uh, form uh, try to deter them and have them move on. Uh, but typically they're, they're around the entire region, but we continue to work hard to, to keep them moving and keeping them from causing havoc on our streets uh, by being out there and being present. Uh, and with regards to uh, just the general, uh, when we we're talking about the general issues with traffic and things like that, uh, you know, we continue to enforce, I continue to encourage my officers, all the district commanders are, uh, as the chief mentioned, is directed from him to ensure uh, traffic safety out here and the safety of our citizens and everything as we see people racing up and down the street, running red lights and doing various activity. I think uh, and when COVID hit, as Chief stated earlier, people, less people on the road, people become impatient. Um, you know, they really start to, I say, go off faster on certain situations. Uh, I was on Route 1 a couple of weeks back and I watched a car travel down the every turn lane and you know to get around traffic and it took me it was heavy traffic unfortunately it took me a while to catch up with him uh there was no real excuse for his behavior he, he really had nothing uh to say about it it was just he didn't feel like waiting uh in line with car traffic with everyone else uh, so we continue to address these issues and and cite them when we can make contact with them uh, like i said that was a heavy traffic situation it made it very difficult uh but when we're fortunate enough to catch up with these folks we can certainly educate them on their behavior and hopefully uh, be an effective deterrent. Uh, as far as the 7-Eleven, uh, the Parkway and Route 1, uh, the 7-Eleven dictates uh, who gets to hang out on their property, not the police. Uh, we respond out there on a weekly basis. Uh, I have officers who are out at that 7-Eleven uh, for some event that has occurred there, uh, whether it be the clerk that's been assaulted, uh, whether it be a larceny, uh, fight outside or whatever the case may be, but we continue to address those issues as they present themselves. Uh, so we're well aware uh, of the issues in that particular 7-Eleven uh, and we've addressed it with the ownership uh, as well, as far as our concerns of uh, uh, the folks that are hanging out there. Yeah, and I'll just also jump in and say, we have a lot of um, revitalization projects um, happening right now um, on that stretch of Route 1 that I think um, in the near future will help to deter um, some of that activity. We have um, <clears throat> new development going in across the street. We have an elementary school uh, being built kind of catty corner to that, um, as well as another um, development that will kind of clear out, um, um, you know, parts of that area. I can also say, and I think the police can attest to this, that the owner of the 7-Eleven, um, he is just as much um, frustrated by um, um, the level of, of, of crime in that particular area as anyone else. And a lot of the calls that are made um, come, from, come from him. Um, so he also wants to see that corridor cleaned up. Um, and as the mention, I'm sorry, as the chief mentioned earlier, um, you know, we're taking steps to um, kind of clean up that uh, hotel site and looking for, um, you know, other developers who can also purchase um, some of the uh, land that's gone dormant. Uh, on that site. And, and we do have some of the land under contract to be developed. And so we're happy about that. And so over the next couple of years, that area will begin to change. Um, but unfortunately, until we get there, until the construction begins, um, you know, we have to deal with um, individuals who kind of use those dead areas um, to commit crimes. Um, but we are aware of it. And, and, and as the chief mentioned, we do have officers there quite often um, in, in large part because the owner himself is also uh, very frustrated by that. Um, next question that I got was um, I'm part of a new community in Potomac Town Center. We noticed lots of speeding uh, in, in the Potomac Town Center as well as lots of noise from cars when the shopping center is closed from midnight to 6 a.m. Can something be done about this? Can cameras, speed bumps and other measures be taken to keep this from happening? 
I want to say there are speed bumps in the town center. Is that not correct? Are we talking about the wrong area? I believe there are speed bumps there. But but nonetheless, uh, and I saw a couple of other speeding ones in here. Featherstone was mentored. Uh, Joe, have we had any enforcement down on Featherstone uh, going in and out of the Veterans Park? Uh, we have uh, a direct patrol over there. Uh, the, the the monthly directed patrol is targeting that area. Uh, but now that you know I've gotten this complaint here, we will certainly make sure to try to get more more hours over there uh, and sort of deter that behavior. Yeah, they're definitely they're saying that it's very very specific that it's on the uh, park side of the railroad tracks that where the speedings occur. And there, I know there's speed bumps down there on Featherstone, but apparently it doesn't sound like it's slowing them down at all. And then the other question in here is regarding um, the noise, the muffler noise. So I think many of the folks on the call probably know this. Uh, July of 21, uh, that became a secondary offense. But then in July of 20, which meant that a police officer could not somebody, stop somebody for a loud muffler alone. Uh, July of 22, the General Assembly heard the concerns of the community and wanted that to be a, 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 a primary offense and the general assembly switched it back so since it became a primary offense on july 1st we notified the force of that change uh, and i know that there has been enforcement on that uh, so if you have a particular issue in your community with a particular car that's one of those things where you can call communications uh, if you have a description of the vehicle we can try and get out there uh, and cite the driver for that. I, I think that, uh, particularly at late hours, that that can be uh, exceedingly uh, dis disturbing to a community. Uh, I think it's disrespectful. I think it's inappropriate. And I think the, the owners ought to be cited when that occurs. The other thing that I will suggest uh, for those of you who have some influence with the General Assembly is that uh, we really need to look at the retailers who are selling this stuff and we also need to look at the retailers who are installing it. I think there needs to be some repercussions for them as well. Uh, that's the source of the problem. If you can't if you can't buy it, you can't get it installed on your car. Uh, you're not going to have it. Yeah, and then I'll also just say, and Chief, um, correct me if I'm wrong. We can't put speed bumps on uh, like major roads. So, uh, you know, I know people asked about like Cardinal and some of the other major roads. We can't put speed bumps on those types of roads that they really have to be neighborhood roads where we put that, that yeah i we don't do speed bumps at the police department but my understanding is that when you have roads that are up at a certain speed limit it's more dangerous to have the speed bumps than to not have them uh, because you gotta you know stop and go stop and go so yeah cardinal drive i would think would be one of those locations that would not be eligible no yeah and, and the county does speed bumps but we can't put them on a major roads so we have a few more questions. Uh, let's see here. Just pointing out, I, I believe, Kathy, I think I know you, um, <laughs> Belmont Bay resident, just pointing out that um, the car races are also happening at the Woodbridge VRE parking garage and, um, and also on Dawson's Beach. And then uh, there's a question, how is it going with the enforcement of new legislation governing the noise making mufflers? You've just talked about that. Are you all able, are you hearing as much? I'm not getting as, as many complaints. Um, but I'm not sure if that's the same on the police side. I'm not getting a lot of the complaints, but I did get, uh, when it changed over in July, a lot of questions as to whether or not we were going to enforce it. And the answer to that question, 100% is yes. Uh, and we have officers out there enforcing that now. So, so I haven't seen anyone, I don't wanna say anyone, I did have a couple of folks that wrote in and they had specific instances in their community um, and we sent officers out to address it. Yeah, and I think you addressed the question about Featherstone Road and Veterans Park. Um, and then just also talking more about some of the car meets. Um, and the question is, who should we call to make noise complaints? Uh, and are, are these noise from vehicles, mufflers? So I'm assuming that. I believe so. Yeah, you can call police communications on that and we'll get a unit out there. So that way... The, the beauty of, if you send a, uh, an email to one of the supervisors uh, and it's happening right there and then, uh, the light, we can't promise the supervisor will be able to address it right there and then. But you can call communications. If we have a unit available, we can get them out there to take a look. Okay. 
Um, I don't see any more questions. We'll just take maybe the next five minutes if you all have any last questions. Um, but, but Chief, just want to go back to um, kind of the overall um, message with regards to um, some of the shootings that we've seen. I know that you all have done a, a good job of making some arrests, um, which you think uh, can help cut back on uh, some of those challenges. Um, and so just want to see if you had any more comments with regards to that. And then also on kind of the traffic mitigation side. Um, and I know that we, we didn't talk a lot of, about this, but for those that have questions, because we get a lot of this about um, cars that have been um, kind of sitting idle in neighborhoods um, where it's kind of obvious that those cars are not, um, are, are not operable. Um, what is the proper kind of procedure for there? A lot of talk about the 10 day notice that police kind of put on, you know, do the police follow up after 10 days? Um, we've been doing a lot more enforcement because I'm getting those calls and I'm following up. But if you can just talk a little bit about that as well. So uh, on, on the violent crime, which I think is, is on many of our minds, uh, violent crime is, is increasing across the country. And um, we are um, uh, become fallen a little bit victims of it too here in Prince William County. Uh, I got to say my prior experience in Washington, D.C., that the level of violent crime that we have in Prince William County is nowhere near the level of violent crime that we had in the city. Uh, but the folks who live here, grown up here in Prince William County, I talk to all the time. They're like, well, we don't even want to be close to what's going on in Washington, D.C. We don't want to have any violent crime. And, and I agree with that 100 percent. But the reason I, I, I say that, though, is to say that uh, it is a small group of people that that's willing to use a firearm uh, to settle a dispute here in Prince William County. And one of the things that we uh, think is critically important is that when those things do happen, is that we find the person who's responsible and ensure that they're held accountable. And then we hand them over to the criminal justice system to ensure that there are uh, consequences that prevent it from occurring again. Uh, I, I say that to say is that we, you know, we need the community's help. Uh, if you see a young person uh, that is doing something uh, which is going to get them in trouble and ruin their lives, please let somebody know. Uh, we can often intervene in a situation before it results in somebody being shot or somebody losing their life. Uh, one of the examples that I will talk about is uh, we had a double homicide over on Mary's Way inside of an apartment uh, this year. Uh, the suspect in that case was a 15-year-old. So now we have two young men in their early 20s that are dead, uh, but we also have a 15-year-old who's going to jail for the better part of their, the rest of their lives. And that is tragic. Uh, maybe there is an adult out here in our community who could have seen that 15 year old spiraling uh, into that situation. And we could have got that kid uh, to some services to prevent that kind of thing. Uh, on the traffic side of the house, we're going to do everything we possibly can to step up our enforcement efforts. Uh, we have a crime briefing now every two weeks where I bring the district commanders and all the captains on the agency. And we talk about crime and we talk about uh, traffic enforcement, and I'm ensuring that our police officers are out there doing it. Uh, I've already spoken a little bit uh, about the, uh, you know, my belief, and you can certainly uh, disagree if you would like, that I think that we need, if we're really going to slow people down here in Prince William County, that uh, automated traffic enforcement is going to be needed, uh, and we'll see how that plays out. And then with regards to the, the abandoned vehicles, Joe, you want to talk a little bit about our approach to that? Yes, sir. In reference to our abandoned vehicles, uh, once we're notified or once we've observed uh, our abandoned vehicles, that 10 day tag is placed on those vehicles. Uh, a combination of our parking enforcement uh, uh, members, as well as our sworn members, uh, will follow up on those, uh, those tags that are placed on those vehicles uh, to have them towed. Uh, we've had quite a bit of those vehicles in this past year uh, that we've had towed, and there are some drivers who continue to uh, to place vehicles back in those locations in hopes that we don't make it back around uh, as, as quickly as we do. So we get some repeat offenders as well. Uh, it does create traffic hazards in some areas, but we are certainly addressing it uh, as quickly as we can. Yeah, and by the way, if your car gets towed, blame your neighbor, not me. 
We get a lot of <laughs> we get a lot of calls of uh, uh, residents wanting the police to kind of do enforcement. So uh, please make sure that your your car tags are are up to code and all of that. Uh, just a couple more questions and then we'll close out. Um, is there anything that can be done to curb the homelessness and littering in the shopping center in Featherstone? And we'll just make that a, a more general question because we see a lot of, um, you know, we, we see, we, we've seen an increase in the homeless population. I know the county is doing everything we can to offer services um, to those that we may see um, um, out on the street. It is up to those individuals to take those services. We cannot make them. Um, but the county does have services um, if you if you see someone um, that may be in need. But again, it is up to them to accept those um, to accept those services. Chief Newsham, did you want to talk just a little bit about you know? No, I think I, I I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, uh, homelessness is really a social services issue. Uh, oftentimes, it's not a police issue. Uh, and I saw a question in here about panhandling, and that kind of falls into the same. You know, this, the courts have decided that uh, panhandling is a constitutional right. Uh, it becomes a police issue if they're creating a, a traffic hazard, and then we can intervene. Uh, but by and large, if you see someone uh, that's out there and they're homeless uh, and they need services, I'm not saying don't call, but we're probably going to divert that to one of the social services agencies to get out there and see if we can offer that person some assistance. Uh, Supervisor Franklin uh, also hit the nail on the head when she said, uh, sometimes some of our folks who are homeless uh, are not interested uh, in receiving services. So it's, it's a difficult situation to address. Uh, you know, and, and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, kind of point the finger at somebody else. But what I am saying is that um, if it's illegal, if someone's breaking the law, uh, whether they're homeless or not, uh, call the police and we will come. Um, if, it, if it's someone who's simply being homeless and, and, and is down on their luck and needs some help, uh, let's try and get some social service agencies involved. Yep. Um, and then another question, does the police department have an app for residents to report crime or concerns? We do not. So um, that is something that's a good suggestion that we can take a look at. Yep. Very, very good suggestion. And then a um, very long comment um, about Port Potomac. I read through it. I think I can um, pretty much summarize that um, a number of kids um, that are playing in the street um, and, you know, I guess uh, some of the kids, you know, maybe, uh, you know, loud or screaming or fighting. Um, and so kind of what can be done by the police um, It says that there are security cameras that are here or civil action. Um, it says the police have intervened many times and we have had some success mitigating. So I'm not sure if you can uh, address that. And again, I think that goes between what can the police do versus the HOA or. Uh, really good question, very detailed. And, and uh, that kind of runs the gamut of there's, there's certain things within there that we can certainly address or try to address. Uh, if someone is trespassing on the property and they have been barred by the uh, property owners, uh, that is something we can we can effectively deal with. Uh, if somebody's damaging your property, that is against the law. Uh, that is something uh, we can obviously we de deal with. Um, if it is something that's being done illegally, like a vandalism, destruction of property. Uh, those kinds of things, uh, and you do have cameras, that's going to be extremely helpful for us uh, to get to the bottom of it. Uh, it can also be helpful uh, for people who have been, um, you know, trespassed, uh, people who, you know, we can, we can cite with trespassing. If we can see them on the property, on the video, then it's something we can follow up on. So um, some of those things in there, um, we can certainly address and it sounds to me like this may be another one where we could have maybe have um, Captain Robinson follow up with the writer uh, and see if we can't be a, a little bit more assistance on that property. Okay. And then last question, are you finding any connection to the young people committing these crimes over the past years as gang activity seems to be a lot of 15 to 19 year olds again a lot of daytime crime from the school age kids, why the sudden spike? And before you answer, I, I will say 
Um, we, we have seen some challenges um, with some of our um, young people, but I do wanna be careful in noting that it's not all young people uh, committing all of these crimes. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely uh, a mixture. And I think we have to figure out, you know, kind of what are the needs of those um, involved and how can we steer them away? Um, and so just wanted to make sure that we, that, that we made that distinction. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, you know, when we look at our arrest numbers at the end of the year, we arrest adults about on, an, on a ratio of about 10 to one uh, with regards to adults versus juveniles. So juveniles are not contributing to a large amount of the crime in the county. We have had some high profile incidents where young people have been involved in, in gun violence. And I know that that is troubling to all of us. And I also think that's an area where we can improve. Uh, I think that uh, we have some high risk kids in our community. And I think what we need to do with those kids is we need to get a hold of them uh, and wrap them in services before they get themselves into trouble. Um, and that's, that's gonna be something that, you know, we will try to do on the government side, but that's also something where we're really gonna need the eyes and the ears of the community to help. If you see a kid, they're not going to school, they're spiraling into a bad place, they're doing really kind of things that uh, looks like carrying a gun, gonna get themselves in trouble, gotta let somebody know. We, we have to get to that kid uh, before they get themselves in a place, uh, in a really, really bad place. So I, I agree with you on that, uh, Supervisor. Yep. Um, and then uh, I don't see any more questions. Um, just want to uh, thank the police department for uh, joining tonight to have this discussion. You know, it's a lot of angst in the community about um, some of the things that we've been seeing. Um, I don't think that our community is, is used to this level um, um, or this amount of crime that, that, that we've seen. But um, as the chief mentioned, um, you know, there is a national spike um, and the levels here in Prince William is not nearly as much as uh, in other communities, but we do wanna make sure that this remains a safe community. I will say, as I, I mentioned before, we do have a lot of revitalization projects going on on the Route 1 corridor. Um, I think that's gonna help um, take care of some of these issues. Um, and we are working with um, our HOAs, our apartments to make sure that they have sufficient amount of um, security features. Um, and if you live in uh, one of those uh, apartments uh, where you've seen some challenges or in one of those areas, please feel free to reach out to myself or the police department. Um, we're happy to kind of have that discussion. If you live in an area that doesn't have an HOA and you're not protected um, with any type of um, security system or security guard, um, and, and you're seeing challenges, please also reach out to us so that we can know kind of where, um, where those areas are and making sure that we can keep a close eye on what's going on there because we want everyone to feel safe. For those that may be interested in a neighborhood watch program, um, please reach out to me and I can connect you with the police department to talk through kind of what that looks like, what goes into that. Because um, we, we do want a safe community, but we also want to make sure that we're still being um, neighborly. Um, I think that's part of kind of the challenges we're seeing. Not as many people know, know each other as kind of before. Um, so we do want to make sure that we're getting to know our neighbors and that we can have discussions one-on-one. -on -one. I get a lot of phone calls where uh, neighbors are complaining about um, each other, and some of that can actually be resolved through a conversation. So I um, just also want to point that out. But we're here to help. We're here to serve. Um, again, I'm Supervisor Franklin. I represent uh, the Route 1 corridor. Um, if there are any challenges or concerns you're seeing, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, I put my contact information in earlier. I will put it in again, as well as our website. Um, and then Pamela Montgomery is my chief of staff. Bertha Johnson is uh, my special assistant. And then Edwin Gonzalez um, helps with doing outreach. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us. And Pam, did I miss anything? No, Supervisor. I think uh, you've covered everything this evening. Okay, Chief Newsham, any parting words? No, I just want folks to know that we take this very, very seriously. We take the safety of our community very seriously. Uh, and I want to thank everybody who took time out of their night. I'm sure there were a lot of other things you could have you could have done tonight, but you took time out to bring your concerns to our attention. And we're going to do everything we can uh, on our side to, to address those things. So thank you all for coming out. Thanks for having us. Thank you all. See you next time.
Good night.